Shalom, hello and welcome to another uh, video response to the comments. Who are the Cushites and Hamites? I see, you know, a couple of comments being spammed uh, throughout the channel that Cush and Hamites are haplogroup J, white Caucasians, and redheaded, etc. Also, that Nilots aren't Cushites or, you know, Nilots aren't in the Bible, etc. This person with the Hebrew letter says, J is descendants of Ham. It is a mistake to say that the Cushites are just black. Cushy means red-headed. Nilotic peoples have nothing to do with Cushites. Nilotic peoples are A, haplogroup A and B. Ham did come from the Lesser Caucasus, Genesis chapter 8, verse 4. Who is white? Do you mean Caucasian? Well, yeah. If you came from the Lesser Caucasus originally, that makes you part of the Caucasian race. Why do you people think A and B, Nilots, are in the Bible? Well, I'm going to explain that very question in this video. So, I actually covered that uh, topic, uh, who are the Cushites, uh, in this video titled Eber and Azurad, who are the descendants of Cush. Uh, the last half of this video actually deals with uh, who are the descendants of Cush, but apparently that person didn't watch this video, so I'm going to do like I did last time. This is just going to be a recap of an older video, and I'm going to use these comments uh, as a reason to recap old information, since it seems like there aren't that many people, uh, or excuse me, since it seems like some people haven't uh, watched some of the older videos. So I'm going to use academia, by the way, to back up my beliefs on why I believe Ham is haplogroup A and B. And with all that out of the way, let's begin. So, Cush. Cush was the oldest son of Ham and a grandson of Noah. Genesis chapter 10, verse 7, the sons of Cush were Saba, Havila, Sapta, Rama, and Shabaka, uh, and the sons of Rama were Sheba and Dedan. Cush is a Hebrew name that is possibly derived from Cash, the Egyptian name of Lower Nubia, and later of the Nubian kingdom at Nabata, known as the Kingdom of Cush. The former Cush appears in Egyptian records as early as the reign of Menenhotep II, 21st century BC. In an inscription detailing his campaigns against the Nubian region, the Nubian kingdom was centered at Moro in the modern-day nation of Sudan. So when it comes to the Hebrew word Cush, as they said, it is likely referring to the ancient kingdom of Cush, which is in uh, modern-day Sudan, and the ancient kingdom of Cush is also known as Nubia. So already right off the bat, we're beginning to see that, you know, the Cushites would be a Nubian Sudanese people. But let's keep reading. This is from Jewish Virtual Library uh, dealing with Cush, and it reads, Cush was the name of an ancient kingdom in northeast Africa, the portion of the now valley between the first and sixth cataracts was called Cush by the Pharaonic pharaohs, though western nations preferred the Greek appellation Nubia. One of the earliest mentions of the name Cush is found on an inscription of the early Middle Kingdom, 1970 BCE. During the second millennium BCE, Cush was absorbed into the Egyptian Empire. First, as far as the south, or the second cataract, under the Middle Kingdom rulers, 
and then as far as the sixth by the new kingdom pharaohs. It was probably the Cushite king Shabako in circa 707 through 696 who encouraged Hezekiah of Judah to resist the Assyrians under Sennacherib and sent the relief army that the Assyrians crushed at the Battle of El Elitech in 701 BCE. Since Taharqa mentioned in 2 Kings chapter 19 verse 9 and Isaiah chapter 37 verse 9 had not yet come to the throne. According to the Bible, Cush was the son of Ham. Genesis chapter 2 verse 13, chapter 10 verse 6 through 8, Ezekiel chapter 38 verse 5, 1 Chronicles chapter 1 verse 8 through 10. And the eponym of the Northeast African people. Most modern translations follow the Septuagint, the whole of East Africa was called Cush by the Greeks. So again, backed up by a Jewish virtual library, here are the sources, uh, and it seems like the ancient Cush would have been people in East Africa yet again, uh, likely people of Nubia, modern day Sudan. So, Cush, this is the Strong's word for Cush, 3568 Cush, a son of Ham, also his descendants, also a land in the South Nile Valley. So, what is south of the Nile? Land and people of Southern Nile Valley. The land, the people. So, south of the Nile would be Cush, south of Egypt, Cush which would be in modern-day Sudan. So, the kingdom of Cush was an ancient kingdom in Nubia centered along the Nile Valley in what is now northern Sudan and southern Egypt. This is from Britannia. The kingdom of Cush, despite the Egyptian presence in upper Nubia, the indigenous culture of the region continued to flourish. This is from World History Encyclopedia, the Kingdom of Cush, and it reads, Cush was a kingdom in northern Africa, in the region corresponding to present-day Sudan. The larger region around Cush, later referred to as Nubia, was inhabited 8000 BCE, but the kingdom of Cush rose much later. The Kerma culture so named after the city of Kerma in the region, is attested as early as 2500 BCE. And archaeological evidence from Sudan and Egypt show that, new, that Egyptians and the people of Kush region were in contact from the early dynastic period in Egypt, circa 3150 through uh, 2613 BCE onwards. So again, uh, the people, uh, the kingdom of Cush is in connection to Nubia, one and the same. And it seems like this is dealing with a people in Africa, a people in modern day Sudan. And this is from the Department of Egyptian Arts from, I believe, the Metropolitan Museum. And the title of the paper is The Land of Nubia. And it reads, The region of Nubia begins at the point just south of Karatum in the Sudan, where the Blue and White Nile join, and is linked to Egypt by the Nile River, which flows northward through both lands to the Mediterranean. The first cataract, just south of Aswan in Egypt, marks the separation of Egypt and Nubia, while the second cataract separates upper, southern, and lower, northern Nubia. So this is the book titled, 
the day the daily life of Nubians and it reads the ancient Egyptians referred to a region located south of the third cataract of the Nile River in which the Nubians uh, dwelt as Kush most often in the phrase vile Kush or wretched Kush so again we're starting to see that basically Kush and Nubia are one and the same that Kushites could in fact be Nubians so this is from the book the Nubian past and, and archaeology of Sudan and it reads the name of Nubia has long been used to describe Egyptian oh, excuse me to describe Egypt's southern neighbor historically other names have been applied to this region and its inhabitants Kush being a widely used term in the ancient world as well as Ethiopia so again Nubia Kush people south of Egypt in this book simply called or named ancient Nubia the land of Nubia stretching along the river now from the first cataract southwards has never been very closely or accurately defined the name Nubia has been used in a much wider sense when when dealing with the past and sometimes it has been used as almost conterminous with the ancient Sudan the area of the present Republic of the Sudan so Nubia uh, is in uh, modern-day Sudan it has been suggested that the name comes from the ancient Egyptian word Nub meaning gold since the area was an important source of gold in chronic times and later but it is not the name the ancient Egyptians used for the country and the suggestion and the suggestion may be fanciful the Egyptians frequently called the area Taseti land of the bow or Kush probably a name used by the inhabitants themselves so this is from the University of Chicago Nubia gallery permaculture and it reads the kingdom of Kush was ruled from Kerma the most powerful Nubian state of the of the early second millennium BC was based at Kerma and partly fortified settlement near the third cataract Kerma was the capital city of the Kerma culture which was which was located in present-day Sudan at least 5,500 years ago Kerma is one of the largest archaeological sites in ancient Nubia so here's the Kerma culture like they said it will be in Nubia and it stretches from this cataract all the way to this cataract or should I say this cataract to this one so it's in ancient Nubia modern-day Sudan this will be the headquarters of the ancient Kush Kushite Empire this book the Oxford history of ancient Egypt reads the king of Kush is the name given in Egyptian sources to the king whose capital lay at Kerma archaeologists use Kerma as an adjective to describe the culture of the Kushites and to dis and to distinguish it from other contemporary Nubian cultures such as C group and Pan grave Kerma is situated south of the third cataract at the termination of the western oasis routes and is being excavated by Charles Bonnet of the University of Geneva the Kerma people kept no written records but we know that their culture found throughout Nubia goes back to the early old kingdom the Kerma Nubians were cattle breeders and warriors particularly famous as bowmen so when you think of Kerma think of Kush when you think of Kush think of Nubia uh, Kerma is an important site of the capital of Kush so this is from 
Historical Dictionary of Ancient and Medieval Nubia, and it reads, Kush. This is the name for a region, the kingdom centered in Nubia. The term Kush and Kerma are particularly difficult to extract from each other. The dic this dictionary refers to Kerma for the period from about 2500 to 1500 BCE and Kush for the time thereafter until the end of Moreau in the 4th century BC. Some Middle Kingdom Egyptian records begin to use the term Kush for what is now called Kerma. The more consistent use of Kush begins in the New Kingdom colonial occupation when Nubia was brought under the authority of the viceroy of Kush or the king's son of Nubia. Thus, Kush may or may not be the true lineal descendant of Kerma, depending on one's definition of territory, nomenclature, or history, but, it's, but it does seem that the impulse towards Nubian state formation of Kerma was born with Kush, i.e. the 25th dynasty, after the after the intrusive centuries of New Kingdom 1567 through 1090 BCE, colonization of Nubia or of Kush ended. And this is from thought.com, uh, uh, the kingdom of Kush, sub-Saharan African rulers of the now. And it reads, the roots of the Kushite kingdom emerged near the third cataract of the Nile River in the early third millennium BC, developed from cattle pastoralists who are known to archaeologists as the A group or pre Kerma culture. The Kushite kingdom is mentioned as Kush or Kush in the Old Testament, Ethiopia in ancient Greek literature, and Nubia. To the Romans. Nubia may have been derived from the Egyptian word for gold, Nuub. The, Egypt, uh, the Egyptians called Nubia Taseti. So as they said, uh, the ancient Hebrews, you know, they would have called this place in South Sudan, Nubia. They would have called it Cush. The Greeks, Ethiopia, and the Romans uh, would call it Nubia. But the Egyptians called it Taseti. And so we're talking about the same uh, place all, all around. Tosseti, Nubia, Kush, uh, it's all one and the same. Kerma, you know, etc. This is from, uh, this is titled Nubia and the uh, Noba people. And it reads, early settlements sprouted in both upper and lower Nubia. Egyptians refer to Nubia as Taseti. Modern scholars typically refer to the people from this area as the A group culture. Fertile farmland just south of the Third Cataract is known as the Cree Kerma culture in Upper Nubia, as they are the ancestors. The Neolithic people in the Nile Valley likely came from Sudan, as well as the Sahara. Saharan a rock reliefs depict scenes that have been thought to be su thought to be suggestive of a cattle cult, typical of those seen throughout parts of eastern Africa and the Nile Valley, even to this day. Around 3,500 BC, the the second Nubian culture, termed the A group, arose. It was a contemporary of the ethnically and culturally very similar to the polities in pre-dynastic Nequada of Upper Egypt. The Nubian culture may have even contributed to the unification of the Nile Valley. So Taseti, let's first kind of get a little bit of understanding of Taseti since that's what the Egyptians called uh, Nubia or Kush. So Taseti. Taseti marked the border area towards Nubia 
and the name was also used to refer to Nubia itself. And so here are some of the towns uh, such as uh, Nitwit, which was the main city, was Abu, and there's Elephantine, part of modern Aswan, and among other cities were uh, Fil uh, Filé, modern uh, Filé, uh, Sunet, and Sunian, modern Aswan, and Han Subek, uh, Obio, modern uh, Kom, uh, Ombo. The district's main deities was Horus, uh, and among other, uh, among others, major deities were Anuet. I'm just going to sum them: uh, Anuet, Isis, uh, Kenum, and uh, Sobek. The Taseti people and their identity is still trying to be deciphered. Today, from what is known, they are believed to have spoken a Nilo-Saharan language. So it's believed that the people of Taseti, the people of Nubia, the people of Kush may have spoken a Nilo Saharan language. And this is where now we're going to get into the language of these people, the language of the Kushites. What language did Kushites speak? Because this can also help us understand what their genetic background would be as well. So, but first let's look at geography. So, Kush. The Kush that the Hebrews would have been talking about, the Kush that's mentioned in the Bible, it would basically be what we know as Nubia, but also modern-day Sudan, Sudanese people. That will be your Kushites, or Nubians. That will be your Kushites. So, this is from Handbook of Ancient Nubia, and it reads, The A group and the C group languages. So let's look into the languages of the Nubians or the Kushites. The A group population was settled along the Nile between the north of Aswan and the south in the second cataract from approximately 3700 until 2800 BC. It predates the Wadi um, Pawar diaspora so that it is unlikely that the language of the A group might have belonged to the, to the northern East Sudanic family. And this is uh, Heritage Daily, Kerma, the ancient African kingdom, and it reads, The kingdom of Kerma was an indigenous Nilotic culture that emerged around the mid-third millennium BC, most likely from the C group culture in the southern part of Upper Nubia. So we see that there is an association with the Kerma kingdom, which we know Kerma to be Kush or Nubia, with indigenous Nilotic peoples, Nilotic culture. And so this is also giving us a more deeper understanding of who these people could be genetically and what they could look like. A uh, continuant says, however, archaeologists now believe that Kerma was most likely one of the earliest African kingdoms identified in the Egyptian texts from the Middle Kingdom with the name of Kush, and that's what we're trying to figure out that rose to prominence due to the strategic position on several uh, cavern routes linking with Egypt, the Red Sea, the Horn of Africa, and Sub-Saharan Africa. So let's look into the languages now. The Nilo-Saharan languages are a proposed family of African languages spoken by some five or excuse me, some 50 through 60 million people, mainly in the upper parts of the um, Chari and Nau rivers, including historic Nubia, which we know to be Kush, north of what north of where the two tributes, uh, two tributaries of the Nau meet. From Libya to the Democratic Republic of the Congo in the century, and from Egypt to Tanzania or Tanzania in the east and so that's actually a very large large mass of uh, land where Nilo-Saharan languages are being spoken basically it, basically it's all over Africa uh, except in uh, Western Africa so we're going to specifically focus on the Eastern Sudanic 
So uh, let's, because there's various subdivisions of the Nilo-Saharan language family. Here's that's Nilo-Saharan, but this is just the sub branches. So our focus would be the Eastern Sudanic. In most classifications, the Eastern Sudanic languages are a group of nine families of languages that may constitute a branch of the Nilo-Saharan language family. East, uh, Eastern Sudanic languages are spoken from southern Egypt to northern Tanzania. So, as we see down here, linguistic classification, Eastern Sudanic comes from Nilo-Saharan subdivisions. We're going to focus on the northern uh, subdivisions because there's northern and there's southern. But we're going to focus on the northern one. And specifically, we're going to focus on Nubian. So again, the reason that we're focusing on these languages, by the way, to reiterate, is that the people of Kush, the people of Kerma, or the Nubian civilization, all one and the same, Tosseti, they would have likely spoken a Nilo-Saharan language. So let's get deeper into this. So the Northeast, uh, the Northeast Sudanic. From Northeast Sudanic, we have Eastern Sudanic and then Nilo-Saharan. So this is sort of like the tree. But from the Northeast Sudanic, we want to focus on Nubian. So Nubian languages. Nubian languages are a group of related languages spoken by the Nubians. They form a branch of the Eastern Sudanic languages, which is part of the wider Nilo-Saharan uh, phylum. So again, here's the linguistic classification. So you go from Nilo-Saharan to Eastern Sudanic to Northern Eastern Sudanic to Nubian. Now the subdivisions of Nubian is now Nubian and Western Nubian. But we're going to just look at, at the trees. So here is here are various trees that various um, linguists have made when breaking up or breaking down the Eastern Sudanic languages. And Nubian is considered a Sudanic language, and Nubian is related to Nilotic languages. It's part of the same tree. Nubian being a more northern Sudanic language, with uh, Nilotic being a southern. And here again, Eastern Sudanic, Nubian is more northern, Nilotic is southern. And here is another, by the way, let me just back up. This is from Bender at 2000. And this is from Riley at 2009. This is from a, a Star String in 2015. And uh, here is from Star Sling in 2014. Uh, Nubian and Nilotic branches. Bench in 2019. Uh, Roger Branch. Eastern Sudanic, we have Nilotic, and then Nubian, Eastern Sudanic, this is from 2020. So now, we're going to focus on Nilotic languages. So the Nilotic languages are a group of related languages spoken across a wide area between southern or south Sudan and Tanzania by the Nilotic peoples. Again, here's the language classification, so let's start back at the beginning. Nilo-Saharan, Eastern Sudanic, Nilotic, and then the subdivisions is Eastern Nilotic, Southern Nilotic, and Western Nilotic. In most classifications, the Eastern Sudanic languages are a group of nine families of languages that may constitute a branch of the Nilo-Saharan language family. Eastern uh, Sudanic languages are spoken from Southern Egypt to North northern Tanzania. So in here are the subdivisions, linguistic classification, Nile Saharan, Eastern Sudanic, and then the subdivisions. The northern one was Nubian that we read earlier, and then now we're focusing on the southern, which is Nilotic. So why is this all important? Well, let's read this. A proto-Nilotic unity separate from an earlier undentrificated Eastern Sudanic unity is assumed to have emerged by the third millennium BC. The Eastern Sudanic unity must have been considerably earlier still, perhaps around the fifth millennium BC. The original locus of the early Nilotic speakers was presumably east of the Nile in what is now South Sudan. The Proto-Nilots 
of the third millennium BC were pastoralists, while their neighbors, the proto Central Sudanic peoples, were mostly agriculturalists. Nilotic people practice a mixed economy of cattle pastoralism, fishing, and seed cultivation. Genetics and linguistic studies have demonstrated that Nubian people in northern Sudan and southern Egypt are an admixed group that started off as a population closely related to Nilotic peoples. And this is why all of this is important. We're trying to figure out who are the Kushites. We know that Kushites are Nubians, Kerma culture, Tosedi, modern day Sudan. And the Nubian peoples are related to Nilotic peoples. This can get us closer to the haplogroup of the Kushites, the phenotype of the Kushites, etc. So let me read that again. Genetic and linguistic studies have demonstrated that Nubian people in northern Sudan and southern Egypt are an admixed group that started off, that started off, that started off as a population closely related to Nilotic people. And that's why Nilotic people are extremely important because that's where Nubians started off as before they became an admixed group. So that means you technically can't look at like modern day Nubians. You have to look at Nilotic people to get the best and closest representation of an ancient Kushite because Nubians are split off first from Nilotic people. Now I'm going to continue what it says. Nubians are considered to be the descendants of the early inhabitants of the Nile Valley who formed, who later formed the Kingdom of Kush, which included Kerma and Moro, and the medieval Christian kingdoms of Merkia, Nabotia, and al -Madai. These studies suggest that the populations closely related to Nilotic people long inhabited the Nile Valley as far as southern Egypt in antiquity. Let me read that again. This studies these studies suggest that the populations closely related to Nilotic people long inhabited the Nile Valley as far as southern Egypt in antiquity. And so here are the subdivisions of Nilotic people. You have Eastern Nilotic people, Southern Nilotic people, and Western Nilotic people. These are the language breakups. Now, why is all of this important? Now, remember, the initial comments is that J is the sentence of Ham, it is a mistake to say that the Kushites are just black. Cushy means red-headed. Nilotic people have nothing to do with Kushites. Nilotic peoples are haplogroup A and B. So remember, they're saying that Nilotic people, Nilotic people have nothing to do with Kushites. But what we just read is that Nilotic people are literally Kushites. You know, and you know he says, why do people think haplogroup? Uh, why do people think A and B Nilots are in the Bible? Well, if Kushites are Nilots, then by default they're in the Bible. But we're going to get into why all of this is important, mainly because of what he said. J is the sentence of Ham, which uh, wouldn't make sense to disagree with that. So why is covering um, Kush, Nubia, Nilots all in connection with one another? Why is that important? Well, here's why. Haplogroups A and B being concentrated among Khoisan populations in the southwest, the Nilotic populations toward the northeast in the Nile Valley, BT is a subclade of haplogroup A, more precisely of the A1B clade. Nilots have haplogroup A. Well, A and B. We're going to focus on A. Upper now. Haplogroup A3B2 M13 is common among the southern Sudanese at 53%, especially the Dinka Sudanese at 61.5%. Remember, ancient Kush is in modern day Sudan. Sudanese people would be Nilot, would be, well, there are Nilotic Sudanese people, but Sudanese people would be the descendants of uh, Kushite people. In a study by Hansen in 2008, analyzed the Y DNA of populations in the Sudan region with various local Nilotic groups included for comparison. The researchers found 
the signature nilotic A and B clades to be the most common paternal lineages among the Nilo-Saharan speakers, except those in those inhabiting uh, Western Sudan. Now, again, what do we learn about the Kerma people? They likely spoke a Nilo-Saharan language. The ancient Kushites would have spoken a Nilo-Saharan language. And the Nubians are a branch. Well, they start off as Nilots. And so let me read that again to show you why this is important. The researchers found the signature Nilotic A and B clades to be the most common paternal lineages amongst the Nilo-Saharan speakers. Nilotic people, Nilo-Saharan speakers, ancient Kushites, modern Kushites, likely would have had half of group A and B. This is why uh, I believe, and the people in my comments believe that half of group A and B are ham. It matches perfectly. I'm going to continue with what, what it says. There uh, there, a prominent North African influence was noted. Haplogroup A was observed among 62% of Dinka, 53.3% of Shaluk, uh, uh, 46.4% of Nuba, 33.3% of Nuar, 31.3% of Fur, and 18.8% of Masile. So here is a chart of haplogroup A and haplogroup A from 14% to 64% basically among Nilotic, Nilo-Saharan, Sudanese, and Khoisan pe uh, peoples. It is a very, very dominant haplogroup among Nilotic, uh, Nilo-Saharan, and Khoisan peoples. Here are all the references, by the way. So, here is a map detailing haplogroup A, and it is basically seen all throughout Africa. It's seen in Western Africa, it's seen in Southern Africa, it's seen in Southern and Northeastern Africa, especially in Sudan, which makes sense, that's where the Kushites were. And again, in South Africa and in Sudan, again, concentrated in the, the lower part of Egypt. And these are subclades, by the way, like A-M31, A-M6, A-M32, and A-M51, and A-M13. Different subclades of A throughout Africa. Here's another map. And as you can see, the distribution of haplogroup A, Y chromosome. And then we see the ancient kingdom of Kush and Nubia. Haplogroup A is highest in that area that would have been the ancient Kushites, the ancient Nubians, Nilotic people, Nilo-Saharans. This is why it makes far more sense when you put all the information together. It makes more sense to say that the ancient Kushites, when the Hebrews met the Kushites, they would have been Nilotic people, especially back then, and they would have had haplogroup A. And so, when the Hebrews are writing in their, you know, writing in their tablets or writing in their scrolls or or papyrus or what have you. They would be writing about these peoples as Kushites, Nilotic peoples, Nubians, people who would have had half of A uh, back then, and to this day still have half of A. And so here's a chart detailing ancient remains we found uh, from graves we've dug. Some of the ancient and oldest um, uh, African markers we actually find. Uh, haplogroups actually are A and B markers. They're the oldest ones, older than even the uh, ones we find of haplogroup E. Haplogroup E is actually kind of, in a sense, kind of young compared to haplogroup A and B. Uh, so here, uh, deep paternal genetic roots in Africa. Uh, so what we find in northern African groups, we actually find A1A, A1B, A3, B2, and possibly B1. Here is it. A lot of this would be an erotic people, so you find A even in ancient, and in some cases we still find it today, uh, half of A and B in Western Africa, and even in Northern Africa, and of course in Southern Africa. But ancient West African foragers in the context of African population history, this paper actually shows that the oldest remains in West Africa are A and B markers. So you find A00, BT, B, 
B2, B1, and B2B. And mitochondrial is typically A0 and A1. So that's very interesting. Some of the oldest West African remains we find are A and B markers. Those would be Hamites. Those would be your Hamitic peoples. Speaking Nilo-Saharan, Nilotic, Pygmy, or Khoisan Hamitic languages. And here is haplogroup B. Our focus is mainly on A, but I'm just going to go ahead and show you haplogroup B. And it's actually very, very widespread throughout Africa, seen in all the way from Sub-Saharan Africa up into like Northeastern Africa and Western Africa. Again, Sub-Saharan Africa and parts of West Africa and the Eastern, Northeastern part. And here's more in the Eastern part of Africa, but also the Western and the Southern part of uh, Central West Africa. And these are just uh, different subclades like B dash M two three six B dash M one eight two B dash M one five zero and B dash M one one two and of course B dash M six zero. So, and here's A again. So you have A and B throughout Africa. A and B would be your Hamites. And then came haplogroup E which pushed a lot of these A and B markers southwards. And as you know, from my model, I would say half the group E is Shem. Shem came into Africa and pushed a lot of the Hamites down, or they add mix with Hamites as well. Uh, here over here is a chart that shows half the group A and B is typically considered to be African, true African or Paleo-African. It is the oldest ones we find in Africa among Nilotic, Igmes, Khoisan, Nilo Saharans, Sudanese peoples. But Haplogroup E, on the other hand, is considered Afro Mediterranean. Again, this is why I consider it to be uh, Shem. And it came in and it pushed people south. So that explains that. Now we're going to get more into morphology. So why are we going to get into morphology? Why is it important to know about the haplogroup of the um, the Kushites? Oh, well, remember, this person said that J would be Ham, and that just wouldn't be correct if you were to go with more academic understanding and model with the Kushites being a melodic people. The Kushites would have haplogroup A and B. But also, what was said was that the Kushites are white. Uh, and that the Kushites are Caucasians, and that the Kushites are redheaded. So that's why, you know, what what do not a lot of people look like? What would an ancient Kushite look like based on the remains we find? What would a Nile Saharan look like, an ancient one? What do the remains, an ancient Kush, an ancient Sudan, an ancient Nubia show us? What are, what is the phenotype of the ancient Kushite? Dental trait analysis of A group fossils found affinities with populations inhabiting Northeast Africa, the Nile Valley, and East Africa. And remember, A group is uh, ancient Kush. Among the sample populations, the A group people were nearest to the Kermaculture, Bearers, and Kush populations in Upper Egypt and to Ethiopians. So it says right there. Followed by the Moronic uh, X uh, group, the Christian period inhabitants of Lower Nubia, and the Kalis population in the Dakula Oasis, as well as C group and Pharaonic era skeletons excavated in Lower Nubia and ancient Egyptians. The linguistic affinity of the A group culture is unknown. Beyond this, Riley states that the range of possibilities remain wide and include a language belonging to another non-Northeast North Sudanic branch of the Nile Saharan family. Craniometric analysis of Kerma fossils comparing them to various other early populations inhabiting the Nile Valley and Maghreb found that they were morphologically close, close 
to pre-dynastic Egyptians from the Quad of 4,000 to 3,200 BC. Dental trait analysis of Kerma fossils uh, found affinities with various populations inhabiting the Nile Valley, Horn of Africa, and Northeast Africa, especially to other ancient populations from the central and northern Sudan. So basically, um, ancient Kushites, Kerma fossils, because you know Kerma is Kush, uh, when it comes to the Kerma, and by the way, here's a map showing you Kerma, Kush. So basically, they would have looked like uh, Africans. They would have looked like Nile Valley, Horn of African, Northeast Africans. And um, that certainly is not red-headed, white-skinned Caucasian peoples. Um, so let's actually look at the phenotype of these peoples. Nilo-Hemetic. Nilo-Hemetic. Intermediate type between Nilotic and Ethiopian that is associated with the Nilo-Hemites or half-Hemites, dark brown to black skin, usually kinky, sometimes tight, curly hair. Then you have the pre nilotic ancient type with proto nilotic traits, today still found in the border region of Sudan, ancient Kush, and Ethiopia. Black skin and kinky, sometimes tight, curly hair. Nilotid, specialized African type, native to the swamps and savannas of the Upper Nile region in South Sudan and adjacent countries, and that would be ancient Kush. With their black skin, uh, they belong to the darkest people on earth. Heads long, uh, facial features uh, coarse with a, with a rather wide nose, full lips and kinky hair, nylots, nylots seem to be a relatively old group that might have extended further east into Ethiopia during prehistoric times. And here's a map showing it. They go from, they, they basically take up much of eastern Africa, all the way up even to southern Egypt. Then you have the South Nilot, type common to the south branch of the Nilot people of Lake Albert, south of Lake Victoria in South Sudan, Uganda, and Western Kenya, black skin and kinky hair. East Sudan, isolated Sudan variety of the Nuba Mountains in Kafwanda, Sudan, native to the region at least since the Neolithic. So they've been there for a long time. A dark brown, sometimes black skin, usually a kinky hair. Dinka, a uh, nilot proper that shows the most pronounced nilot features, the tallest, most long -led legged, and one of the darkest phenotypes in the world, typically found in the swamp areas of the Upper Nile in South Sudan. Again, Upper Nile in South Sudan would be Nubia. Black skin and kinky hair, very tall and very tall, the tallest of all modern phenotypes. So the Dinka is probably a good example of what ancient Kushite would be. All these groups actually are good examples of what ancient Kushites would look like. And again, all these peoples have haplogroup A and B, typically A. Then you have the Shilukuyid, not a lot variety similar to the Dinka, or Dinka, but with slightly morphed features, uh, typical, typically found in the savannas in the upper Nile of South Sudan. Again, that's, that's Nubia, that's Kush. Black skin, usually kinky, sometimes uh, tight curly hair. So I believe that Ham and Ham's descendants had half the group A and B, this is why. This video was specifically dealing with Kush uh, because you know of the comments that I saw. The Kushites are Nilotic, Nilo-Saharan, Sudanic slash Sudanese, and Nubian people. That's who Kushites are. In ancient and modern times, these people would have haplogroup A and B. Haplogroup A and B is considered true African or Paleo-African. Now, some Nubians today, some modern Nubians have haplogroup J, but that's not the origin of these people. The Nubians do not originate 
the haplogroup J marker. Ham did not originate the haplogroup J marker. Cush did not originate the haplogroup J marker. The J mar the only reason some Africans have haplogroup J is because it migrated at some point in time into Africa and people mixed with African women. And that's why you find some modern day Nubians with haplogroup J. But as I read in the other paper, Nubians first split off from Nilots, and Nilots had haplogroup A. Therefore, Kush would be haplogroup A. In this, and so uh, in this same, this is actually the same issue that we have with calling modern day people with haplogroup J Semitic today. Check out my latest video, Haplogroup E versus J, because, you know, like some people say, because people in the modern Middle East have haplogroup J, then they must be the originators of proto-Semitic people. But no, Semitic, uh, Semitic people, proto-Semitic people had haplogroup E. J came in later and adopted Semitic from haplogroup E, and that's why you have Semitic people today with haplogroup J. But anyways, uh, just because a modern population has a particular haplogroup doesn't mean it was always there. Nubians are a branch of Nilotic people. Therefore, Nubians who are true Kushites would have haplogroup A and B. Furthermore, when the Israelites met Kushites way back then, you know, 3,000 years ago, or made mention of Kushites within their writings, they were likely talking about Nubians or, you know, proto-Nilotic people which back then Nubians are, you know, Kushites would have had half a group A and they would have been black African people living in Sudan. So they would not have been red headed or white or Caucasian or anything like that. They would have been, they would have been super Negroid, I guess you can say. So again, just to re reiterate everything that I said, Kush, Kush, son of Ham, uh, also his descendants, also a land in the South Nile Valley, a proto nilot unity separate from an earlier undifferentiated Eastern Sudanic unity is assumed to have emerged by the third millennium BC. The Eastern Sudanic unity must have been considerably earlier still, perhaps around the fifth millennium BC. The original locus of the early Nilotic speakers was presumably east of the Nile in what is now South Sudan. The proto nilots of the 3rd millennium BC were pastoralists, while the neighbors, the proto-Central Sudanic peoples, were mostly agriculturalists. Nilotic people practice a mixed economy of cattle pastoralism, fishing, and seed cultivation. Genetic and linguistic studies have demonstrated that Nubian people in Northern Sudan and Southern Egypt are a admixed group that started off as a population closely related to Nilotic people. That started off as a population closely related to Nilotic people. Nubians are considered to be the descendants of the early inhabitants of the Nile Valley, who later formed the Kingdom of Kush, which included Kerma and Moro in the medieval Christian kingdoms of Merkia, Nobotia, and Albada. Excuse me for my mispronunciations. These studies suggest that populations closely related to Nilotic people long inhabited the Nile Valley as far as southern Egypt in antiquity. These studies suggest that populations closely related to Nilotic people long inhabited the Nile Valley as far as southern Egypt in antiquity. So who would the Kushites be? Ancient Kushites will be Nilots, Nilotic people. So what would an ancient Kushite look like? Nilot, specialized African type native to the swamps and savannas of the Upper Nile region in Southern Sudan and adjacent countries. With their black skin, they belong to the darkest people on earth. Heads, uh, long features, coarse, with a rather wide nose, full lips, and kinky hair, Nilots seem to be a relatively old group that might that might have extended further further east into Ethiopia during prehistoric times. What would the haplogroup of the ancient Kushite 
of a nilot haplogroup A. It is seen highest among the nilotic peoples, and it is seen in modern-day Sudan as well, as well as other related nilotic and nilo-Saharan populations. And if we look at a map detailing ancient Kush, ancient Nubia, and the distribution of haplogroup A, Y chromosome, we see that it fits perfectly. It overlaps perfectly. The ancient Kushites would have had haplogroup A, not J. And they would have been a black African people, not a Caucasian red-haired people. Don't take this personally, but I have to use your comments to explain and recap old videos. But this is why I advise people to watch my old videos because some of the things that's left in the comment section I've already covered. I know specifically the person who made this comment didn't watch the video because I asked him uh, earlier. Uh, but you know, this is this is you know why I had to do this video. But anyways, this is where I conclude the the video, and uh, hopefully this was informative and you kind of anyone who's new to the channel kind of has an idea as to why I say, you know, Ham would be A and B. Hopefully this video kind of broke things down for you. I will return and do deeper videos on the Hamites because I feel like they're a very interesting people and we should know a little bit more about them. But um, this is where we end. And hopefully y'all have a good rest of your day. And Shalom.